And he closed the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. And he just said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them. And James picks up on the very same theme of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, we must be patient and we must pray. If you're able to stand with me today, stand and let's read James 5, verses 13 through 20. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back a sinner from his wandering, will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You may be seated. So from the beginning of the letter, James desires that believers are to be growing and maturing as they live by faith. So what the book is about, living by a real faith. In order to live by faith, we must be doers, as Jesus said, of the word, of his word. And James offers us three ways in which we are to grow and live and act. Again, we've went over it time and time again, but it's something we all need to remember. In chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, to bridle our tongue, to visit the needy, to keep yourself unstained. James is saying that how we use our words matter. How we treat each other matters. And our personal holiness matters. Throughout the entire letter, we have seen how he weaves these things, these three things together in his letter. He has taught much about the way we use our words, how powerful the tongue is as an instrument for good and yet for evil, that we are to not speak evil against one another. We are not to say today or tomorrow, I'll do this or that and leave God out of our plans. Rather, we ought to say, if the Lord wills. He even includes something concerning our words here in his conclusion. Do not swear. You shouldn't have to swear. He has taught us also much about how we are to treat one another. No partiality. If a brother or sister is in need, we are not to just say, go in peace, be warmed and filled. Rather, we are to help them. We are to show mercy to them. And finally, throughout the book, we find James teaching about personal Holiness, living by faith, is always accompanied by works that demonstrate that faith is real. We must know the sin cycle of chapter 1, how temptations give birth to enticements of our own desires, and that gives birth to sin. And finally, when that is grown, it leads to death. We need to know that in order to live in a godly way. And so we must put away, James says, all filthiness 
all rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. We must be on guard from bitter jealousy, from selfish ambition, and from pride. For James says that God opposes the proud and yet gives grace to the humble. So personal holiness includes, it includes living a life of repentance and humility, ever depending upon his grace. And again, in this conclusion, James includes a word of personal holiness in verse 12. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, reminding believers that believers are to live a life of integrity. Our Father is trustworthy, and when we live otherwise, we do not reflect the truth of who he is. And so we arrive at the end, and James is eager to tell believers that personal holiness also includes patience and prayer. Prayer is the expression, both the inward and the outward expression of depending upon the Lord. His wisdom, his trustworthiness, his goodness, his sovereignty in every circumstance we can possibly find ourselves in. So when we think of suffering and afflictions and troubles and difficulties in our lives, when we encounter sickness, both physical and spiritual, when we have wronged somebody and our, and we have a need to mend those broken relationships. James says we are to be driven to prayer. To radically depend upon God to do what only God can do. Prayer then is acknowledging God's sovereignty and power to meet every need that we have. He alone holds the answer to our suffering. He alone is the source of our joy when we're cheerful. Regardless of our circumstances, God is our sufficiency. Jesus said when we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or when we pray like that, we're to pray that God let your name be holy. Because it is. Jesus taught us there again in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to know our position. Our Father who art in heaven. There he is. And all the way down here is where we are. Seemingly so distant from him. We need to know our position. Yet we can, who believe, who he has saved, we can approach a throne of grace with boldness knowing that he, though far away, is our Father. He's that near. So we have to understand, though, what our position is when we pray. He's the creator. We're the creatures. He's all-knowing. We have to admit we are limited in what our knowledge is, even of what to pray. Sometimes we don't even know. Paul said to the Romans in chapter 8, we don't even know what we ought to pray. And the Spirit of God helps guide even our prayers. He's the leader. We're the followers. He's the master. We're the disciples. He's the great shepherd. And we are his flock. There's a story that Joshua tells us in chapter 5. And they were getting ready to cross the river and on into Jericho and there and there are past Jericho and on into the promised land. And this is what Joshua saw. He lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to the angel of the Lord and he asked, are you for us or for our adversaries? The angel said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. This is to be our attitude in prayer. He's the commander. And we may ask, are you on our side? But that's not the correct question to ask. 
The right way to think about it is we're on his side. He is the commander, not us. This is why James uses the military term for us to submit to God. And in prayer, we are submitting to God's will, not our own. This is what happened in Acts 4. As I mentioned that this morning to the kids, we pray God acts. James tells us the same about the prophet Elijah. Elijah prayed and God acted. Elijah couldn't couldn't hold back the rain nor bring it to, to, to come to pass. But God did. God uses the prayers of his people. It's an amazing thing. He ordains both the means and the ends. God uses our prayers as the means of working out his purposes in the lives of his children. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Often while suffering, in whatever way, I'm prone to grumble, to complain. Sometimes, Michelle would say, I'm prone to even shut down, build walls around me, and give everybody the silent treat, treat, treatment. Brothers and sisters, today you may be suffering in need of wisdom and patience and encouragement. The Bible simply says one word, pray. Paul wrote to Timothy that scriptures give us everything we need so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. My question is, are we going to the scriptures to be taught how to pray? What to pray for? Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Also a sword of praying that we find throughout the book of Psalms. How often do we pray only though when things are hard? Yet when they get better, we're so forgetful to even give thanks. Suffering can lead to grumbling and complaining, even rebelling against God. But even in times of cheerfulness, we can find ourselves becoming complacent and at ease, satisfied in ourselves, and God is often forgotten. David prayed this in 1 Chronicles. I love this prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. What a short yet beautiful prayer of thanksgiving. You know, our church at Gospel has much to be thankful for. From its inception as a church plant nearly 15 years ago, to a church merger nearly four years ago, under leaders like Chad and Bill and others, by the help of countless people who have been enabled to faithfully serve the Lord here and serve others here, we, friends, have much to be thankful for. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. Let them pray over him. James suggests that there are times when you who are sick ought to call the elders. Oil is often used symbolically in the the scripture by setting someone apart. And sometimes there needs to be prayers that need to be set apart for special circumstances. Here it seems to me that there is a time for that. Does he mean every time that there is a sickness? 
or that there is some secret formula to being healed? Of course, it doesn't mean that. The Bible never promises us that every time we are sick, we're going to be healed. Sickness may be a trial that we must endure and be steadfast in. Even through sickness, we who are saved can live by faith and grow spiritually. But again, notice that we are to pray in the name of the Lord. In other words, we are to pray in his will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That should be our prayer. We pray in faith knowing that he knows our need before we ask. He knows better than we could possibly even know about ourselves. Sometimes the ultimate healing is to bring a believer home. We've seen that in Steve's life and in the life of, of the Bowers. Even this week that a believer has been ultimately healed because he or she has been brought home. There is true healing in that. It is the Lord, though, who does the raising up, either to renew a person in physical health, whenever that is, or literally when he raises them up to himself. Sometimes sin, James says, is the result of sin. I'm not saying every time, but even when it is so, as we see in 1 Corinthians 11, there is forgiveness available. Therefore, James says, confess your sins. That word is really false. Confess your faults against one another to one another. That's what James is saying. Pray then for one another that you may be healed, that your relationship may be healed. James says to make it right with a brother who you have sinned against. What a great invitation, confessing our faults against one another. What a wonderful thing it is to go to someone and say, I have sinned against you, brother. Will you forgive me? Will you pray for me? How can we pray for one another when we're holding a grudge with one another? We can't do it. James is deeply concerned throughout the whole letter and here about unity and fellowship. And this sometimes requires going to a brother or sister and confessing by humbling ourselves, desiring reconciliation and praying together. What a tender yet powerful exhortation it is. James points out the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Yes, Elijah had been made righteous. That is, he had been made right with God, just as James told us that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Yet Elijah was also a man with the same nature just like ours. He was just like us. This should encourage us this morning that this grand man in the Old Testament, a prophet of God's word who fervently prayed, he just prayed, he just trusted, he just depended on God. And if it looks like he's out of our reach, no, he was a person just like you and me. He was right with God Yet, he was ordinary in many ways, like we are. So, living by faith, he prayed. And God acted with incredible results. As James looks out over his congregation, he noticed those that were suffering. He noticed those that were cheerful, he saw those that were sick. He saw brokenness in relationships needed, that needed restored. And this is what he said. That prayer is depending on God in every circumstance. And that is 
our answer today as well. I look out. I can see people that are suffering. I know some of your stories. I can see people that are cheerful. I know something of your lives. I know and I see and I talk to and I text those that are sick. Those that need the prayers of the elders and others in the body. So we're not so much disconnected from the facts of what James is teaching us. James closes his conclusion with a call to act ourselves. There's a commentator, Doug Moo, and he says this, For James, correct doctrine cannot be separated from correct behavior. What the mind thinks, the mouth confesses, and the body must do. James simply says, doers must act. Let me read the last two verses And we'll quickly come to a close. My brothers, if anyone among you, that's the third time, by the way, that he said that. If anyone among you is suffering, if anyone among you is sick, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back, whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of of sin. James had told us that we are to visit. One of the evidences in our lives is that we care for others. We visit those who are in the greatest needs. We don't sit back and wait to be asked to come. We go on our own volition because that's what love does. Love acts. Love goes. Love converts. Love brings back. Unlike the one who is sick, who calls for the elders. With the one who wonders from the truth, there's no such call. Nobody who's wondering is out there begging us, believers, brothers and sisters, to come find them, to come rescue them. We must do that. We must be the ones to make the move, not wait on them to ask for it. Man, that is strong and that is so true. Paul helps us greatly here when he writes to Titus. He says this, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, listen to this, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Now think about that. Truth and godliness are to be together. Faith without works is dead. When truth takes hold of our minds and our hearts, it changes the way we live. There is evidence. There is fruit. Jesus said concerning this very same thing. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will do something. It will act. It will set you free. Truth has a consequence when it's implanted within our hearts. James told us way back in chapter one of God's own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should do something, that we should be a kind of first fruits. God has given us new life, a new birth. He does that through his word of truth. Jesus is the word of truth. He is God's word. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. James is saying, when we see another among us who is wandering from that truth, whether whether it be in what he says, in his talk, what he believes, or the way he acts in ungodly behavior, that we, somebody, must attempt to bring him back, to convert him back to where he was. And whoever does that will bring him back will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. Let's be clear. You and I don't save sinners as Christ does. But our Father uses us as the means by which to save sinners and bring them back. Who is James talking to? The elders? No, he's talking to all of us. Any of you. 
Any of us who sees a brother or sister that's wondering has a responsibility, a duty to go to them, to visit those who are in their greatest needs and to bring back the one who errs from the truth. The one who's in error is the one who's wondering. We cannot see a person's heart. Is someone among us wondering, are they backslidden? Are they slipping just a bit away from the truth or in their behavior? Are they doing that? We're to go after them because we don't know, number one, if they're backslidden in that sort of a state or if they never knew the Lord to begin with. So we can't see the heart. Only God can see the heart. The only evidence that we have from one another that James teaches us is what they profess with their lips and the lives that they lead. So the responsibility of caring for others, of hearing their words, of watching for repentance and godliness in each other falls to all of us. That's what the church is. We're a group of people following Jesus together. And when one of us slips, we need somebody there to pick us up. To say, Doug, get over this way. Doug, get your thinking is not right. Let's talk about this. Doug, we love you. And we want this right. I need you. And you need all of us. We need each other. Jesus is the only one who truly rescues. If you're perishing today... Jesus can save. He rescues the perishing. He's the only one that can cover a multitude of sins. He is our atonement. He is the one who offered his life for another and satisfied the Father's wrath against sin. And he has called us, you and me, with our lives and with our words, with our actions, to proclaim that very gospel. James' word tests our faith. Is my faith real? Am I enduring? What part am I playing in the body? Am I bearing fruit? Am I patient? Do I pray? Do I long to be spiritually healed? Do I long to be in relationship with each other? Will I obey God and bring back the one who wonders? Church, we have a responsibility to God and to each other. We're to love God and we're to love others. And sometimes that means going to a brother or sister who has wandered from the truth in either what they say or think or how they act. Now maybe you're here today and you've wandered far from God. Maybe you don't even know why you ended up here this morning when half of our congregation is not here. Maybe you feel like you've wandered so far that he won't receive you and that it is hopeless. Well, like the old song I quoted earlier says, Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. He alone can cast your sins away, can forget your sins. His broken body, his shed blood, his empty tomb testifies that if you will repent and believe the gospel, he will receive you and he alone will cover a multitude of sins. God, help us this morning. And God, thank you for the book of James. Let's stand together as we pray.